Good afternoon, good morning exporters. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for joining us today. I am uh, very excited to be here today. We have uh, um, Jan Paul joining us today as well and we've got a couple of colleagues from IBT online. I'm just giving everyone a couple of minutes. Uh, we're still having people logging on. So I just uh, wanted to make sure we started the broadcast at the hour as promised, but we're just giving everyone one more minute to uh, to join us this uh, this morning, this afternoon, regardless, you know, depending on where you're logging on to join us today. Um, just uh, really giving a little bit of uh, um, a round of introduction as we wait for uh, you know for people to join us today. We have a fantastic panel uh, that is going to uh, walk us through exporting to Europe. We'll be discussing um, solution challenges and solution to the European supply chain challenges and then dive into some of the tools that you might need uh, you know, to, to be able to, to overcome these challenges. So today, I, uh, my name is Joella Zarotto, probably some of you might have seen me before. I'm the Senior Line Marketing Manager here at IBT Online and it's my great pleasure to welcome to our webinar uh, Jan Paul Oleschlager from the uh, Holland International Distribution Council who is going to dive a little bit deeper into uh, who they are, what they do and what solutions and, uh, and opportunities they can provide to US exporters who are looking to enter, grow and establish themselves in Europe. And we'll also be joined by Susanna Hardy, Chief Content Officer here at IBT Online as she goes through some of the details of uh, digital um, business development tool, what it takes and also gives an overview of uh, the European market and uh, you know some of the top three markets as well from a, a digital perspective. So as we uh, get started, just maybe a couple of words about um, IBT Online, who we are. So uh, IBT Online, uh, for those of you who don't know yet, stands for International Business and Technology. So we are a digital marketing technology firm with a strong um, you know, passionate mission of supporting US exporters in growing their international sales, brand and business online in your international target market. So today we'll focus on Europe in the specific. So, um, you know, quick facts, you know, we're a US based company. We've over uh, nearly 20 years experience in the industry. Uh, we have team members based uh, across the world. I personally am based here in Europe. So today I'll be joining, giving you some insights on some of the campaigns we've been running in Europe. But again, uh, some numbers here, we have been, uh, uh, you know, we have partnership with over 25 US states. We run uh, website localization and online marketing programs in over 40 countries, over 25 now languages. And we really are helping, um, you know, over 650 US based customers that have leveraged online global tools to grow their Expo sales brand and business globally across our 2000 and counting online global programs. Diving in the um, agenda for today, as we mentioned, we will start by taking a look at uh, uh, Europe Online. What is the state of things and why is this such an exciting market space for US exporters? We'll then hand over to Jan Paul to have a look at the uh, HIDC uh, uh, resources for businesses. And then we'll go into diving a little bit more in details about global supply chain disruptions. And uh, the IBT Online team will then look at the three major European markets and how to reach them, your best practices and tools to allow you to do that, how to serve European customers, but also supporting your re European partners. And then we'll end with some consideration on setting warehousing and fulfillment in Europe. And Yopo is going to share some actionable takeaways for you today. Before we move on to the uh, very last bit, we want to always leave a few minutes at the end for takeaways and Q&A. So we promise we'll uh, uh, you know, stick to uh, the 45 minutes. Might go. We have a lot of content to share with you today, so we might go slightly over. Uh, we will have some polls and a small survey at the end of uh, the session. Please do feel free to, um, you know, pop any questions throughout the webinar. There is a, uh, a chat box that you can see uh, on, uh, um, you know, on your desktop. So please do send us your question and then the team will curate them and we can either respond to them as we go through or we can then, uh, you know, take them up at the Q&A uh, at the end. Perfect. Then without further ado, conscious of time, jumping into uh, having a look at what Europe Online is all about. So here we just wanted to give you very much a bit of like 
the, the top level, the big picture uh, information as we then dive into more specifics, but, you know, online is uh, is a big world and in Europe, because of such differentiation on the market, it's very important to understand, you know, how are these tools going to be effective and why should you invest in a, you know, an, in a digital and an online strategy for your exports? Well, this just gives you some top level figures that to me are quite impressive. So here we can see, um, you know, Globally, we have obviously nearly 5 billion uh, internet users, but what really always amazes me, even if I spend a lot of time in this, uh, you know, in this, in this market or in this industry, is that averagely we spend nearly seven hours a day online. And we work online, but we also purchase, we research, we do business. So really our lives after the pandemics, but even before, have really moved to the digital space. And very interestingly, 92% of users accessing uh, the internet is on a mobile phone. So this is quite telling about what we're always around with our phones, but also, you know, how important this is to leverage for um, your export and your marketing strategies as well. Social media is something that I personally am quite passionate about, especially, you know, uh, when I get asked the question B2B versus B2C, does it work? We'll get into more details a little bit later on today, but just to, you know, plant the seed, I wanted to show you some numbers here. We're talking about 4.5 billion, 4.6 actually billion social media users across the globe. And here very much, you know, year on year change, we gained 10% over the past 12 months. So is a trend that is not slowing down. It's going to continue to grow and it's going to become more and more important um, as we go. The European Union, um, as I'm sure you all know, is a um, it's a very particular uh, you know, set of markets. I don't want to call it one market because of one economy, because it's made up of so many diverse and different markets. But if we want to look at it as an overview, you know, here we have 27 countries with uh, nearly four point, you know, 450 million inhabitants, you know, 87. 86% of them are on the internet. So again, look at those numbers. You know, we're talking about nearly 400 million internet users and 311 of them are reportedly um, e-shoppers. So they have purchased online, whether it's for the personal or for the business. But there is again another trend that we'll touch upon a little bit later that is booming and is not going to stop. So here, just a quick comparison, you know, uh, 27 different countries really making up a very interesting economy for exporters to, uh, to really thrive within. I mentioned e-commerce, and this is something that is uh, very important and very important to note. It's a large, it's a growing space, and it's a mobile space. So we know that eight out of 10 uh, European internet users searched online for goods or services over the past 12 months. But also the e-commerce adoption rate in uh, in Europe is actually um, is higher than the uh, world average of 76 percent. If we look at, for example, the top here, we have Poland, Germany, Austria, Italy, Spain, all of them above the worldwide average of e-commerce adoption. So very, very dynamic, very, very interesting e-commerce space with, you know, we have some global players. You have your Amazon, you have eBay. But we also have some strong regional players in uh, or regional iterations of these players, which is something very interesting and very important to keep in mind when starting to do e-commerce and business in uh, uh, in Europe. We talked about, uh, you know, e-commerce, we talked about online purchases. Very, very important to keep in mind, this is not only for B2C, but B2B is very, very much booming in terms of online purchases. So. 74% of B2B buyers used online tools, search engines, social media to research. And we saw a 50% increase in, uh, in 2021 of purchases online for B2B purpose, purposes, so business to business uh, purchases. We also know, obviously, it's quite interesting to note, 80% of European businesses have their own website and over 40% are actively uh, using social media for their marketing. So European businesses are getting uh, used, are adapting to this changing environment. And then we're here today to discuss how you could also leverage this and you know, what opportunities and where you know, the quick wins will lie. But before we go into too much detail about website and, and online marketing, I'd love to um, hand over to Jan Paul to uh, dive into uh, section two and just tell us a little bit more about the HIDC and what they do for businesses. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Joel. Um, it's really great to, to, to be here and to do this uh, presentation uh, together with uh, IBT. Uh, I think uh, IBT and HIDC together are really like a perfect uh, combination for, for companies uh, who are uh, either setting up uh, European supply chains, chains or growing uh, European supply chains. Uh, in my day to day work, I'm in touch with a lot of US companies, and I see that basically the main two topics where companies run into are either related to digital marketing and website localization on the one side, and on the other side, it is very often related to supply chain and, and compliance or supply chain compliance. So the combination of both is, is, is really interesting, I, I think, and, and, and hopefully uh, we can give you some useful takeaways uh, during the presentation. Um, so uh, a short introduction, my name is Jan Paulisager and I'm a supply chain, uh, senior supply chain here at, uh, at HIEC. Um, um, a bit more about HIEC or the Holland International Distribution Council. Uh, we are a private not for profit organization uh, representing and promoting the Dutch logistics sector. Um, we are a membership based organization. Uh, we have over 300 members, and, and most relevant in this context are on the one hand the logistics service providers, and on the other, on the other hand the, the facilitators. Uh, logistics service providers, I guess most of you know what that means. Uh, that's companies that are able to ship, store, uh, deliver, uh, and handle your products. And the facilitators are companies that are uh, uh, offering services. So that can be uh, related to customs, can be related to VAT, can be related to, to employment. And, and, and what we see um, that that a lot of companies have questions on, on those issues. And I am, as an organization, HIDC, is able to help companies to, to provide uh, by providing information and sharing our network and, and making introductions to the to the companies uh, in, in, in those sectors. Um, it's really important to know if you look at the names mentioned in the, in the text box, that's of course meaning the global players, um, both on the facilitator side and on the logistic service provider side, but actually a very large portion of our, of our membership base are by themselves smaller sized companies uh, working out of one warehouse or the facilitator side that are more like uh, boutique kind of firms that are really focused to help small and medium sized companies. And, and, and I know that today uh, that is basically a lot of and most companies are not the multinationals, but it, it are indeed smaller sized companies. And, and, and I want to reassure you that in our membership base and also in our day to day work, we are in touch with a lot of companies that are in, in, in your position. So, you know, relates to the problems you face and can help you with the data your problems you face. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, global supply chain disruptions, um, maybe not directly related to this, to, to this webinar, but still because there's so much going on in the world, we want to share you know, a bit of information that we see. Uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, with the disruptions in manufacturing, with port congestion, uh, that's of course a lot of things. But to be honest, I specifically when you look at port congestion, in Europe the situation is, is, is not that bad and it hasn't been that bad over the last two years. Uh, even during and after the Suez Canal blockage and now also during the Ukraine-Russian war, uh, European ports are, are, are open, they're uh, running pretty efficient. I so there's no disruption on, on, on the inbound, but you know, once a ship arrives in Europe, yeah, of course, getting there can be an issue, but once it, once it arrives in Europe, um, then everything runs pretty smooth. So there's not too much concerns on that side. Uh, and, and you know, of course, that, that in, in the US, that's a completely different situation. So so thankfully, we're, we're good on this side at the moment. And, and I actually, I anticipate that, you know, it's going to stay pretty OK in the, in, in, in the near future. Um, if we go to the next slide, huh? uh, one thing that did have huge consequences and still does have consequences in European supply chains is, is Brexit. Uh, um, it is a hard Brexit, and basically that means that every container, every pallet, every shipment going 
from Europe to the UK or other way around is affected. And it really it doesn't matter what kind of product it is, what kind of shipment it is, uh, you know, it is all being being uh, being traveled. Thankfully, you know, the main disruptions are are are, are, you know, not, are kind of solved, but still, you know, customs is there and, and, and the procedure is, is is not as efficient as it as it was supposed to be, and it's not as efficient as it was given the EU itself. So from the Holland International Distribution uh, side, what we've seen right after uh, Brexit, also still now, is that a lot of companies that had their operations in the UK and who were serving customers throughout Europe from the UK, and that includes a lot of US and Canadian companies actually, who decided to start up in, in the UK and, and who were basically um, pretty successful until Brexit. They would start to us um, um, after Brexit and, and they were really like desperate for a uh, for solution uh, because their business was, was heavily uh, affected and, and, and they really needed to, to work for a different, different way to, to reach their customers in the world. So those companies would be able to help to find a new uh, partner who could take up their warehousing, to take, of their, uh, take care of the distribution in Europe, and also they had to be helps to set up, you know, a new structure for for VOT and customs and and and, and all the you know the paperwork side. Um, speaking, we, we anticipate that this is going to stay, you know, a, a, a matter of fact, also in the in, in, in the longer future. Um, so so basically, for companies who are you know. Considering to move over to Europe, um, yeah, now you need to decide where we go for UK or where we go for Million Europe, and, and and of course you can you can send products from one from from Million Europe to UK or the other way around, but then you need to you know realize that that you know it's going to have some impact on your efficiency, it's going to have impact on, on, on customs, it's going to have impact on 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 on, on the customers and everything. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. Um, if we look at in, 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 in general what we see in, in uh, the global supply chain disruptions, um, and on a larger scale, I will see that that Western countries, Western companies, and even consumers are, are becoming less uh, want to become less dependent upon overseas sourcing, so either from countries or for for or from companies from from specific parts of the world. And as a consequence, uh, we see that there's a lot of uh, developments where companies decide to 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 go over to to reassuring. That's mainly European companies who have production in, in other parts of the world are now bringing that back. Uh, we see that um, companies are, are asking their logistic service providers, their free PLs, to take care of postponing manufacturing, to have their products closer to the market, and then have them like, customized closer to the market. Um, very important, we see that um, in order to avoid out of stock risks, um, Companies are increasing their inventory levels, and they want to have more inventory closer to the consumer market. Uh, so there's really a, like a build-up of, 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 of products closer to the market uh, on the one hand, and, and what we see on the right-hand side, side uh, of this of this uh, slide. Um, specifically for smaller and medium-sized companies, uh, we see the fact that um, the uncertainty in, in receiving products is really a big issue. At the global players, the large companies can find a way around this, and they have, you know, like you know, some structures to 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 to, to you know solve issues. But specifically, smaller and medium-sized companies are really struggling. Um, in addition to this, what we see of, and specifically with U.S. companies and Canadian companies is that uh, in the past it might have been feasible to ship products from Asia to the location in the U.S. Uh, in bulk, have the products there, and then like split the, split the stock 
uh, the, the local stuff for US would stay in, in, in North America and, and the European products would be shipped to Europe. Well, that is a lot of things more just cost wise or to ship, ship products from Asia, Asia to US and from US to Europe is just too expensive. And of course, with the disruption is also like, you know, we run a very good kind of movement. So a lot of companies are looking for a way to ship directly from Asia to, to Europe. Um, but that's not easy. And that's also specifically the case because the smaller companies are really like, you know, suffering that um, the logistic service providers, the airline, for sure, of course, also the container liners are, are, are in a position where they decide what's going to happen. They see that there's large volumes coming on, they're going to increase the rates, they're going to work for the global players. And you, as a smaller sized company, company, you're really struggling to, to, to get your product on a page, to get your product on a page, and ship it to, to either US or Europe. So that's kind of a situation that we see on, on uh, because of the global disruption. Stock is building up in Europe. Uh, warehouses are going through, uh, but smaller companies are really struggling to find a solution. Um, that's also a thing that I'm going to discuss in a bit more detail in, my, in, in the next slides. So now I'm going to hand over to to Joel or Suzanne actually, and the is going to take over. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much. This is fantastic and very fascinating. I look forward to, again, our audience uh, hearing more about this as we go into presentation. Before we move on and uh, I'll hand over to Susanna to uh, have a look at the three big players in Europe, I just wanted to uh, to launch a quick poll to see, uh, you know, we have a fairly engaged audience. I've seen a couple of questions come in and really what we just wanted to, let me launch this. Perfect. Well, we just wanted to uh, to see before we love, before, you know, we'd love to know before we go any deeper, are you already exporting to Europe? So, um, yes, are you exporting via your in-market partner, a distributor or an agent? You know, maybe you're doing e-commerce. Maybe you're doing, uh, you know, an in-market partner. Again, just through, uh, through a third party or a partner, you're not doing any direct e-commerce in Europe. Uh, are you only doing e-commerce or maybe you're only on Amazon? if you're exporting in euros so tell us a little bit more about that so then we can also keep this into account you know as we go and we you know shape our conversation and make sure that we share as much information that is relevant to uh you know to the audience that we have here today so i'm just looking at the responses that come in and first of all thank you so much for a very active response i can see the majority are actually um very established on e-commerce but non so many have in market partners i think there is a slight majority that are doing e-commerce and um, and then we have a good split between uh, uh, in market partners only and in market partners and uh, and e-commerce so i can see that we're still getting some responses in so i'm going to let let the few of you who haven't responded fill in looks like it's steady okay excellent I'll close the poll, but thank you so much. Very interesting. And again, we'll review all of this um, at the end in terms of, you know, tools and, uh, uh, you know, and and uh, and key takeaways for those of you who are in Europe and for those of you who are in Europe in different ways. Perfect. Then moving on to section four, I'd love to hand over to uh, Susanna Hardy, Chief Content Officer here at IBT Online to have a look at the three major European markets. Susanna, can you hear us? We might have a slight technical glitch here. Looks like Susanna might be joining us in due course. So just conscious of time, guys, you stuck with me. So I'll uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the three major European markets. And then when Susanna is able to join us again, I'm sure she'll be able to uh, to join us and, and take over. But without any further ado, let's dive into this. And uh, you might not you won't be surprised to know uh, who we're talking about when we talk about the three big uh, players. We're talking Germany, United Kingdom and France. So looking back uh, to last year, Germany had the biggest e-commerce customer base with over um, 62 million uh, online shoppers. Uh, the UK followed uh, closely with almost 50 million and then France ranked third just by uh, just by three million, I say, but at uh, a nearly uh, nearly 45 uh, million individual shopping in uh, shoppers, sorry, in 2021. 
So um, we Joelle, can see here. I... Oh, Susanna, please. Welcome I know. back. <laughs> I'm just, I, I, thank you so much. I cannot get my camera to work, but hello, everyone. And apologies for for uh, my technical issues this morning, um, but I'm very happy to be here now. I actually just want to whiz through these slides quite quickly as we really want to dive down into into the um, the, the the meat and bones of it. But I wanted to also to give a quick overview of some of the top top markets for the online world. So Germany, obviously, you know, the big powerhouse of of, of Europe. But if we look at where they are online, it's quite interesting. Now we talked about nearly 84 million people just look at the number of mobile cellular mobile phone connections as you see on the next slide there's like you know there's the more phone connections than people 93 percent of those 84 million people are online and uh you know it's growing strongly i also think it's very interesting websites in germany don't just reach those 84 million they stretch beyond that the sphere of influence that we talk about for Germany is more like a hundred million people. So a a dot de of your you know U.S. company dot de your German website could well reach a hundred million people. And when we look at the the social media platforms, you're going to see something that you all recognize very well as well. WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram were the top ones throughout. But there's some very very typical characteristics that you'll find in the German markets. When the Germans use, and these are, these are big generalizations, but we find it again and again, so you know, we, do, we do take this on board. When we're doing online, online marketing and social media marketing in these markets, the Germans are discreet. They don't, they're not like sort of, you know, the, the Latin, Latin American who loves and this, you know, who, who, who shares, who likes, who, who uh, downloads pictures. You know, the Germans say yes, no, nothing. They don't like to share personal information. They are extremely aware of compliancy. They, after all, initiated the whole GDPR phenomenon. And beware, they do leave reviews. Get ready to answer them. Um, I, guess, I guess if I sum up a Susanna, are you still with us? <laughs> Looks like Susanna might be having some technical issues. So if you can all hear me, I'll just <laughs> pick up again. We're having a bit of a teamwork makes the dream work here. So as Susanna was mentioning, and Susanna, please do jump in uh, when the call reconnects or when your computer is back up. But um, as Susanna was going to say, um, you know, she was talking about summing up what makes a great German website. So when you're looking at website localization for the German market, let's not talk about Germany, but, you know, as we saw to reach all of the German speakers across Europe, what do you need? Well, the best websites in Germany are in German. That sounds like a given. Susanna, you're back. <laughs> Hi, Susanna, can hear you back. Or not. Okay, so the website are in German. Um, especially with such a specific language, you know, those of you that know a little bit of German will know that finding the right keyword is vital. We've put an example down here, which I, down there, which I am not trying my luck at pronouncing today because I don't want to embarrass myself in front of all of you lot today. But this is one word, so technically one keyword that stands for companies providing mass communication services. So with a marketing hat on here, this is a Google Ads nightmare. You know, imagine fitting that into a headline or a description. But this is something to be very, very mindful of when you are writing content for your German website or your German online marketing. Finding the right keyword is vital. But also you need to make sure you're compliant. So impress them, cookie policies, privacy policies, have them all correct on your website. And this will build trust. But also strong content. Susanna mentioned, you know, uh, German users don't like to engage on social media, but they take a lot of time reading your content, analyzing your content. So that's very, very important for them. And this will make, you know, make or break the, the relationship with your brand and, and your business. Moving on to the uh, the next big big player again, I just want to uh, run through these, uh, these slides a little bit quicker. Uh, you know, you're familiar where France is. 
fifth economy in the world. Again, very, very, very uh, online first, very mobile first. You know, out of uh, 65 and a half million, we have 60 million are on online, are online and 52, over 52 and a half million are active social media users. So very important to, to keep in mind when, you know, building your, your marketing, but also your export strategy in, in general. And they are also very, very avid uh, e-commerce users. So here we can say, uh, you know, the number of people that have purchased via the internet any goods for B2C or B2B is close to 50 million. And this, uh, you know, is, is a big, big, big increase from, uh, uh, from previous year, especially in terms of the total annual spend. People are not only purchasing, but they're purchasing more. And this is a trend that, again, we don't think is going to slow down. If anything, it's just going to become bigger and bigger. Um, the UK, so uh, where I'm ca calling in from today, uh, again, uh, number three in Europe, sixth economy in the world for GDP. Um, we're looking here at a very, very, uh, again, active, um, uh, active online user base, 68 million uh, users and 66 million, so 98% of the population is on the internet and 84 of them are on social media. So again, when we look at e-commerce here, we have a very, very strong growth in terms of total annual spend, nearly 10%, which is 11 billion from, from year on year growth. And again, all of this is, or 50% of this actually happens on mobile, which is important to keep in mind, not only when you look at, uh, you know, where your resources should go, but think about your website, make sure it's mobile optimized because otherwise you'd miss out on 55% of potential purchases. And this, again, why do we talk about website localization? You know, why is this important? Well, a question we get asked pretty often is, why can I not use, you know, my US website to go global? Well, we talk about Europe is a number of different markets, is a number of different languages, is a number of different search engines. So Google, for example, here, market leader in terms of search engine share in the UK, they are localized. So Google has different iteration for uh, Germany, for the UK, for the Netherlands, for Italy. So they will pick up your website differently. And it's very, very important that you give the right signals to the search engine in the right market to be able to be picked up a little bit quicker. This is just an example uh, of, uh, you know, what, is it, what does it mean? Why is this important? So here I've asked, um, so I'm here in, in the UK and I've asked a colleague of mine in Grand Rapids in Michigan. I say, okay, if you Google, and here we were just joking around, as it was after the pandemic, you know, we both have pets that uh, like to, you know, be the noisy as they possibly can when we jump on a webinar. So I said to him, right, if you were to, uh, you know, Google squeakless squeak dog toys, what do you get? And we did a bit of an experiment. And as you can see here with the same keyword, you already see we have uh, maybe some of the big players. You have Amazon, but in the US is Amazon.com. In the UK, we get Amazon.co.uk. But also we get some more local websites that, uh, you know, maybe I haven't heard of. Chewy.com, um, you know, Multipets and uh, FreedomPullHarness.com. Very US, even Michigan uh, local websites, whereas here in the UK, I get um, bugsandbunnies.co.uk, timeforpause.co.uk. So again, similar keyword, very different results. And if you want your website to show in this google.co.uk searches, you need to make sure that you have the right domain, but also the right keywords that would work. And that Google in the UK, google.co.uk will pick it up, will rank it higher because it knows it's dedicated to your UK audience. And here, just again, a very quick example uh, in terms of um, a website that is localized. So here I've taken a website that's localized for the German market. And as you can see on the left, uh, it's very clear the majority of traffic comes from Germany, Austria. We have some views from Switzerland, from the Netherlands as well. There might be, uh, you know, some keywords that are uh, rather similar. You know, it doesn't filter, you know, you can still get some organic views, some referral views. If someone is on your US website, they can still visit your German website. But this is a very straight very strong indication to google.de that this is a website that is localized and optimized for the German audiences. And as you can see on the right, you can even go uh, even deeper if you did any paid marketing and concentrating on some of the big cities if you wanted. Here, our client wanted a global reach, and that's fantastic to see activity throughout the, the German markets. 
I've mentioned domains and I don't want to get into too much detail here, but domains uh, do play a very big part in the choices that you have when entering a new market, European specific. You can take a more general view, for example, Amazon.eu. Again, strong indication that this is for the European area, or you could go a little bit deeper and want to uh, focus on, uh, in this case, it would be Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.de, Amazon.it for Italy. It really depends on your uh, market strategy, your market enter strategy, your business strategy. So if you have any question on what domain name should you choose, you know, please do get in touch. We're always happy to uh, to walk through the options and uh, to see what would make the best sense for your specific case. One of the big things we talked about, and again, I'm rushing through here, so I hope that's, uh, that's not too fast, but I just really want to make sure that we give uh, enough time for the rest of the presentation. One of the really, really big thing that you need to be mindful and really careful with is GDPR. So uh, GDPR came into play a few years ago and is very, very important to make sure that it's prohibited without the right setup to transfer data outside of the EU. So if you have data collected in uh, from your European website, you make to make sure that you have everything in place to be GDPR compliant before you can import them into the US database, before you can make sure that it's in your CRM, before it could even be linked to your CRM. So do your research, do your compliance work. This is going to save you a ton of time and money in the long run. Um, online compliance is just a few examples um, you know, of what I get served with every day when I try and look uh, at a website. So cookie policy, uh, making sure that you have uh, an impressum if it's German, that you have uh, your privacy policies in place. All of these, these are just some examples from some websites. Cookie policy, localized for the market, translated in the right, um, in the right language that if your users want, they can go and find it. Perfect. Just as a very quick um, roundup before I hand over again uh, and we move on to section five. Online global program, what does it take to enter? You know, what should you have in uh, uh, to enter Europe? Look at your domain name. Have a look at your navigation. Make sure that, you know, everything is multilingual. Mobile, as we've seen, make sure mobile is, in, is very, very important. Local languages, we talked about cultural aspect, but also keywords, optimizing for search engine. Uh, hosting, this goes with the domain name, make sure that it's hosted locally as well, but also regular requ regulatory requirements. Look at GDPR, make sure that you do your compliance work before you go live in Europe, just to make sure that you save yourself some, uh, some time and money. Fantastic. Uh, we talked a little bit about localized websites. We haven't gone into uh, maybe that much detail, but before we go on to the next session, I'd just like to launch another quick poll and just see if any of uh, you attending today would like to receive a bit more information on localized websites, um, local compliance, anything that it takes to make sure that you have the right um, online presence in Europe, whether you already have a European website that you're now saying, oh, maybe I need someone to help me review that, or maybe you're thinking about that and uh, you know, you're saying, my US website is really not getting found you know, in, in Europe, what do we need to do? So it's excellent to see. I can see quite a few of you would uh, like to have um, to be for us to get in touch and have a few more information. I just hope I haven't sparked any panic, <laughs> but I we look forward to you know we'll get we'll be in touch with um, you know more information and we look forward to uh, you know to discussion and see really how our online global programs website and localized website uh, in particular can help you really enter and leverage the, the power of your online presence in, in Europe. You can see a few more are coming in. Fantastic. Excellent. Let me close this poll and I'll move on and uh, I'll hand over again to Jan Paul to have a look at the section five, how to serve your European customers. Thank you so much, Hugh. Um, you know, I can really relate to, to what you just mentioned, uh, how important it is to have localized websites and to, and to really spend some time on this. Uh, we see quite often that we help companies to find a logistics partner, they put their products in the warehouse, um, and, and there's hardly any growth. And then if we're in touch with those companies, uh, because they reach out to us and they say, okay, we're a business logistics company, we've uh, been here for a while, and you know, business is not developing as we anticipated. Eight out of ten, the problem is indeed website customer localization and all this kind of stuff. Uh, um, it, is, it is really important, um, and, 
and it's really nice how to, to start moving into Europe to put your products into Europe if you don't have this in place up front. Okay, so I, I, I really completely relate to, to what's just been told. Okay, now a bit more on supply chain again. Um, our first uh, say a few words on, on the main uh, main uh, distribution models that are used, and then I'll round up this section with, with what we see, what would be the next step for, for a lot of companies who are right you now in, in transition, growth phase of the and for most companies, and specifically for business to business uh, kind of operation, um, uh, we see that uh, companies have distributors in different countries, um, and, and a distributor buys a product, it's ordered, it's produced, and it's shipped typically in, in relatively large uh, volumes, so a full container. Or, like a number of pallets, if it's a uh, like small, little, smaller uh, kind of product, fit directly to the distributor. Um, so this would be called uh, an indirect model because you are not in touch with your end, your end customer. Right? The customer who buys a product from your distributor, you don't have any connection with them. Um, so that is a disadvantage for you um, because you don't have any data information. The distributor is quite often also uh, selling products from, from, from other manufacturers, more competitors mainly. Um, and and uh, where well, we see that um, uh, specifically in, in, in the supply chain disruptions and everything, this, this, this model is not, not the most optimal, not for you, but at the same time, also not for your customer, for the dis distributor. Uh, basically, in most cases, you would ask the distributor to buy your product ever be or H words. So we would need to take care of the of the international uh, shipping. Uh, and even if you would sell a uh, uh, CIM, you would still be responsible for payment of duties and, and, and VATs. So a lot of burden and a lot of hassle for your customer. Uh, what's not the best for them specifically with, specifically if you also have suppliers who are already you know in Europe. Uh, other things you will need to take care of as I will be to act as the individual record. Uh, you will most likely also be responsible for, for compliance. And, and very important, he needs to uh, maintain a relatively high inventory level, right? Because he needs to have the product available, he needs to buy uh, relatively large volumes. So that's, you know. Pretty much a burden on, on, on his cash flow and his operation because he needs to have the stock available. So for very for, for most companies, this is a, you know the, the starting point to start selling their product to Europe, but it brings you know significant disadvantages. If we move to the next slide, now there's a similar situation if we speak on uh, on, on, on e-commerce, on, on cross-border e-commerce, uh, and here we, we discuss both the business to consumer, but also the business to business. Kind of a similar situation, all shipments are sent directly from the US to, to customers. Um, typically with, uh, with, with UPS or FedEx, um, and specifically if you have larger products, you would need to share, uh, you would need to ship uh, with air freight. Then for sure you have a big issue. Um, so, so not very, uh, uh, that's not very efficient. Uh, but for you, it does bring advantages, this, this structure. Uh, there's a minimal setup required. You can start right away. It's scalable, it's, it's very flexible. Uh, so, so it does make sense. But specifically for your customers, there are some significant disadvantages. As, uh, and, and, and this is for sure the case if you, you sell to, uh, to direct to, to consumers. Um, they would be responsible for payment of duties on VAT. Um, quite often they don't expect this. So you really, really need to make sure that this is that they are worn properly you know, on your website, that they know that this is you know an extra that, that they will will be charged. Um, if not, you know you are disappointed customers or in a business to uh, business environment, like business are typically a bit more familiar with this, but again, if they if you're contaminated by uh cyber product locally from Europe, they don't have this also, so maybe you are like you know on a on a level playing field. Other uh, relevant things have 
in total, international funding rates are to send over the ocean uh, should be really relatively expensive and very important returns are really difficult to handle. So again, same as what I just discussed in the, in, in the traditional uh, supply chain model, um, we understand that this is a, 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 the first step to start selling your products in Europe. But if you want to grow, if you want to be successful, if you want to compete with, with European-based companies, um, this is not going to be a uh, 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 great success. So, final distribution model I would like to discuss, if we can go to the next slide, is uh, fulfillment by Amazon, which is, of course, huge. Right? Uh, and, and we see a lot of companies who are really successful in, in North America using Amazon. And, and this again relates also to, to, to what uh, other people from my uh, from, uh, IBT can tell you. And being successful on Amazon or in North America does not automatically mean that you will be successful in Amazon in Europe. Um, but but you know, that's not my expertise. My expertise, expertise is the supply chain part. Uh, basically, Amazon has a great uh, solution in Europe. Uh, it has warehouses in, in, in seven countries. Uh, and even uh, you can ship your products to most other countries as well. So you can cover most of Europe if you use Amazon. And of course, they can like you know they can take care of a lot of service. They will take care of the shipping, the, the customs, the, 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 the packing, returns, customer service. So great solution. What we see in our day-to-day work if we talk about supply chain in relation to uh, Amazon, is that companies are really struggling to, to make sure that their inventory level is 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 is, um, is okay. I think they are keeping their inventory level uh, in order from a location in the US is really difficult. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to ship products in time, the forecasting is difficult, lead times, difficult, a lot of issues that, that make, um, um, that we need US based companies to be less successful using Amazon in Europe as they are in, in the United States. So if we move to the next slide, um, and what we see that the, the as I just uh, discussed, uh, Joel, could you please move on to the next slide? And the three models that I just uh, discussed, um, it was really, it makes sense that that company start with, with the models that we just described, but in the long term, um, it's not the best solution for you, it's not the best solution uh, for your customers, so you will basically need to move on to the next model, and that is uh, described in the next slide, and that basically means you would need to set up an operation, a warehouse somewhere in Europe, and, and that gives you, gives you basically the opportunity to do what, what we call meaning European presence. Yeah. No need to set up a legal entity, there's no need to pay local uh, uh, taxes, there's no need to hire staff. You can have an outsourced warehouse where you put your products and from there you can ship your customers. The very good thing is, and a lot of companies don't realize this, this is that you can sell B2B, you can go or you can sell C2C, and you also have your problem with the Amazon fulfillment uh, uh, taken care of. So, really, there's been uh, significant uh, advantages. Uh, and, and to add on a few, a few uh, important things to mention uh, for your B2B customers, it gives them the opportunity to. to um, to, to order uh, smaller volumes with a higher frequency, which is very attractive for them. Uh, we can offer a free shipping to most of the uh, B2C customers, which of course is a big, big uh, plus. Um, organizing a returns becomes much easier. To be honest, you know, it's not as it is in, in, in the United States or in, or in North America. We don't are still an issue in Europe, but we see that there's a lot of developments. So I think in, in, in a couple of years, it will be possible to have like, you know, a, a good return operation for most products throughout Europe uh, on a very competitive, competitive price. So given a few more years, um, it is already possible, but, but, but you know, there's still a few uh, steps that need to be taken to, to really help us, you know, on a, on a scale. 
a very important point um, uh, consolidation of the inbound, more specifically if you can avoid shipping from Asia to US to Europe, but if you would ship directly to Europe, um, have a consolidated inbound can, can, can really be a cost saver. And also the fact that your refining now becomes cheaper makes it possible that even if you have an outsourced operation, the total uh, supply chain cost would be the same or probably even a bit lower. And that's, of course, you know, a very important thing to, in, in order to become successful in Europe as well. So that is the final slide for me on, on, on in this part. So I will hand over to Joel again. Well, thank you so much. You'd think that I'll find the unmute button at ease, but <laughs> apologies, take a couple of seconds. That is um, fantastic. I'm also um, a bit conscious of time, so we're going to uh, have a look at supporting European partners, and I just want to dive into uh, a couple of case studies as well as part of this, really linking back to what uh, Jan Paul, you were saying about uh, you know how best to um, to leverage the the geography, but also I want to dive into maybe a bit more of the IBT online uh, speciality, which is the marketing piece and how to really make it work and how to get the customers and then uh, uh, you know get your products moving across uh, across the market. So um, just very quickly to start, you've seen uh, you know we talked about uh, very briefly about our online global programs. And here the idea is, you know, what is the most efficient way to uh, to support your partners and your in-market partners? And very much, you know, is to provide them with a localized presence, which will be a trust, credibility, and eventually, you know, generate traffic and leads. So to help our US partners achieve exactly that, here at IBT, we have designed our IBT online um, global programs, which leverage, uh, you know, website localization and online marketing and e-commerce to help you reach new market, be found and be understood in your target markets, but also generate leads, B2B, B2C, grow your brand awareness, credibility, trust, own and control your presence, but also, you know, measure and manage your online presence. So all of this is very, very important when you're looking to um, enter, expand, establish yourself in a market. So in this section, we wanted to touch upon a couple of the elements that maybe are less thought about when you're planning. And the first one that for me is always, always key is, you know, there are a few homeworks that you need to do when you want to launch in a new market. And one of them is, uh, uh, you know, making sure that you understand your buyer persona. So who is your buyer persona? What is your buyer persona? So for those of you who are not familiar with the term, uh, you know, your buyer persona is a fictional representation of your ideal customer. So this can be, be based on demographic information and real data about your existing customers. What's important here is that your European or your international uh, buyer persona might be slightly different to your domestic or your US buyer persona. So a few questions you can ask yourself is, uh, um, you know, I, should I treat my distributors as my buyer persona, but also how do they find me? How do my European customers search? Am I looking at the same decision making uh, structure within the companies? Who has got the final, you know, the final say? And all of this is going to help you build your website, but also your marketing strategy. So everything really um, relies on your buyer persona and understanding your target audience. So here I just wanted to bring some examples uh, from the market. So here we have an example of L'Oreal, who I've picked because they are very often cited on how spot on they are with their international marketing. And, uh, and here is just an example. So L'Oreal UK, here we see women, they're out, they're having fun, empowered, and uh, uh, you know, they're out in the streets that could very much be London. And then we move on to um, L'Oreal in France. And here is, uh, is a little bit different. Here is very much about uh, the planet green, is about the ingredients they use. It's a slightly different message that they know really resonates as important for their French speaking audiences in Europe. And then the other example here is for, for Germany. So Germany, in uh, uh, we can see here, they're celebrating the 30th anniversary of uh, the, the brand being in the market, but also here is all about technology. It's all about, you know, this event is something that is relevant to the market. And, you know, this message will change in the next few weeks very, you know, probably, and it should, but at this point in time, they know that this is what their audience will react, will respond, and they're very mindful of that. So these are some examples just to show you that you need to be mindful about what your buyer persona, your audiences will expect, and then make sure that you are uh, respectful of that. 
Another big thing, and here again, I can hear some of you that maybe are in the B2B uh, and you talk about social media. Mm, will it work? Will it not? My advice, yes. Here, I just wanted to show you, uh, you know, the percentages of uh, uh, social media users uh, versus the total population globally, but also with a bit of a highlight into Europe. So Northern Europe, 85% above way above even the US, but this is one of the highest percentages in uh, in the world, followed by Western Europe and, you know, Southern Europe is, is not far behind. So very much an important piece. And it's not just for B2C. So here I just wanted to provide some information about the percentage of decision makers uh, who use social media to research a new product or a new service. And here we're talking about business decision makers. YouTube. The second largest search engine, you know, don't think of YouTube just as a social media channel, it's a search engine as well. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. So these are just, you know, 50% of your prospects are on LinkedIn, are on Facebook, looking for the next thing, researching the brand they want to do business with. And if you're not there, then you should, because you're missing out on opportunities to be found and to be, uh, you know, contacted and for them to liaise with you directly. I talked about keywords for the German market. This is not only important for the German market, it's important for every market. And the reason why, you know, this is important, it could be a search engine, but it could also be, you know, anything that's social media, anything that's content, whether you're writing a blog for your website, be mindful of, uh, of your keywords. Using your right keywords is crucial because taking an example of social media, for example, you only really have the short snippet of, of text that you include in your caption um, you know, the, the for for really your audience to make the decision whether they want to engage with you or they don't, whether they scroll past, or whether they want to read the full post and maybe even click and go to your website. So that bit of text is very, very important. And making sure you use language that is native to them, that will feel natural, is not forced, it's not going to come through as an ad, is going to make the difference. So here I'll just give you a quick example. If we were to do a campaign in Portugal, and uh, we have a train line, for example, that, uh, that we've helped. If you wanted to be appealing to your, to your Portuguese, Portugal Portuguese speaking uh, prospects, you would use the word convoyer because that's what 98% of uh, people in Portugal would use when thinking or writing about, um, about a train. Whereas if we were in Brazil, then you would, do, uh, you would rather use the word trem because that's you know, how they use, how they speak. Might be a silly example, but this is just, you know, a quick example and a, a, hopefully a clear example to identify a, a word that could be very simply mistaken. They probably understand them both, but the importance is, you know, to create native-like experiences, native-like content, as we say, which eventually will help you increase engagement, but also help you build that trust. You're not going to come across as a spam or an ad. You're not going to be the trusted partner that's got the right information for them making them engage with you, bringing them to your website and starting the buyer's journey. So here I know that um, um, social media sometimes is a bit frowned upon in the B2B, very much uh, active in the B2C, but I wanted to bring you here two examples from some of our clients at the moment. Uh, they are leveraging online marketing in Europe uh, in different ways for B2B and B2C, but also how they link it with the website. So in this case, the first example I wanted to bring you is Spencer Health Solution. So they are uh, they operate in a very specific and quite highly regulated environment. So you know medical health. So they focus primarily on B two B and they're very very specific with their industry. So here uh, we have supported them with the launch of two localized websites. One is in Dutch, one is in English, and and here we've launched some a social media campaign. So for them. You know, B2B, they're going after very specific demographics. LinkedIn was the platform of choice. And as you can see, we have different campaign objective. One is to uh, raise brand awareness. Also to introduce a new product to the market. And by leveraging social media, by putting the content in front of the target audience on a platform we know they're on, we're spending time there, you know, having some nice creative, you know, introducing the product, bringing them back to the page, bringing them back to the website. But what I wanted to show here, you know, our method is to drive, as we say, top funnel to the website. So users are not familiar with the brand, they're not familiar with, uh, with the product. We want to redirect them to the website for them to learn, to engage, and then for us to be able to go back to them, uh, you know, with more information in due course. But what's important here is the localization, as we said, 
the Dutch market wants to be communicated in Dutch. They understand that that's their market. They will have the keywords they recognize. And that's just so important to make sure that you diversify your approach. The second example here, again, social media, but in this case, we're moving to uh, Facebook. And here is a slightly different take. So this is um, Hartru, so a leading manufacturer of tennis court equipment. So here we're not talking about the BTC where we're selling to, you know, you and I who are going out on a Saturday morning playing tennis. We're talking about reaching tennis clubs, reaching association, you know, selling, you know, the equipment that they will need for their courts. But nonetheless, we know that they engage on Facebook. We know that we want to redirect them back to their um, to their e-commerce website. So here, our campaign has very clear objective: sales via the website and sales via social media. So we are here leveraging for them social media targeting to reach in-persona audiences, to reach people that have engaged with us before, who can then decide to purchase directly on Facebook. As you see here, we have some examples. But also they can decide to go back to the website, browse the full product list, and then make the purchases from there. So it's very much, uh, you know, leveraging that synergy between what you can do on social media, your localized website. But again, here the word of the day is localized. As you see, they have a presence in Germany, in the UK, in France, and everything we do is specific to that market, is specific to their audiences. And then the product that we selected to promote is also specific to that specific buyer persona that we have identified and that we've mapped out at the beginning. I'm very conscious of time and I do want to move on to some Q and A's or at least to, uh, you know, I know we have another section uh, for Jan Paul to just wrap up a little bit. I just wanted to share a quick heads up and maybe debunk a little bit of a myth. Susanna mentioned earlier, you know, Germany, they don't really like, you know, you don't, you're not going to get, I mean, we're generalizing here, but you're very not likely to get a huge social media engagement, you know, likes, shares. It tends to be a lot tamer than markets like Spain here. So here is an example from a client of ours who's been running e-commerce across um, social media, but also from uh, um, on the website. And we can see here the social media engagement in blue. If you look at Spain versus Germany, I promise you there are some lines in blue for Germany, but they might be so small that compared to the rest of it, you can see them. And this, you know, you could say, okay, our German marketing in on social media is not really working. But then if you looked at the blue and the yellow, so the sessions, the visits to the website and the sales that was generated directly from users coming from social media, it's not bad at all. So again, it is working. You know, we are selling just as much in Germany as we are in Spain from engagement from social media. We just don't get the same number of likes and shares. So this you know, what does it mean? Why am I sharing this with you today? It's just a heads up and saying, when you look at social media and your strategy, don't stop at what you can see on the page on Facebook or LinkedIn. Don't just judge the, your successes from what you see on platform. Make sure you track it. Make sure you look at all of your results. But also make sure you understand your buyer persona. That's going to tell you a lot about why something is happening and how you should be uh, analyzing your results. Jan Paul, I am nearly ready to hand over to you for the last section. I just really wanted to launch a uh, last poll here, just taking um, a little bit of our audience's time to ask whether uh, anyone would like to uh, to find out a little bit more about uh, um, online marketing, possible grants. As I mentioned, we have a dedicated online global marketing for international marketing programs, leveraging search engine and, and social media marketing content marketing, uh, CRM. So there are a lot of, uh, of you know, elements we haven't had the time, unfortunately, to touch base on today. But if you are interested, you might not be marketing in Europe just yet, or maybe you are in marketing in Europe, but you're not getting the results you would like, then do get in touch. And, uh, you know, we'd love to talk about it and we'd love to see, uh, you know, how our online global programs uh, can support you grow, not just your traffic, but also your engagement and your conversions through your hopefully localized website. Oh, that's excellent. Um, I can see there are a few, few of you that love to uh, to get in touch with us. So I'll look forward to those conversations, and uh, I'll just close this poll if that's okay, and I'll hand back over to uh, Jan Paul. Okay, great, uh, Joel. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, uh, we are uh, kind of short of time, but thankfully, you know, we have a few last slides. Um, so, we just discussed. Could you please move on uh, to the next slide, Joel? 
Um, and we just discussed uh, that, that if you really want to become successful uh, you, from, a, uh, from a supply chain, from a logistics perspective, uh, setting up start as a local warehouse somewhere in Europe is, is the way forward. The uh, question, of course, is you know, what is the preferred location? Uh, we see that quite a lot of companies then decide, okay, we go to Germany, France, UK, or you know, Spain would be the main market, they go to Spain. Um, but the what we can see is that also there's a very big portion of companies that decide to set up in, in, in the Netherlands countries, so Netherlands, Belgium. Um, and the reason is pretty simple. Um, most of the previous slide, please. Um, the reason is pretty simple. Uh, the the Netherlands countries are right in the middle of the main European markets. So France, Germany, UK. So you can reach those countries pretty easy, and at the same time, also uh, we have good connections to uh, to Scandinavia, to to Eastern Europe, to to Italy, Spain, uh, and also like you know to those countries, it's it's similar. So Netherlands, Belgium are really located in the, in the center of Europe, and, and, and have direct and very good access to 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 all of Europe, including the green markets. Another uh, thing, of course, has to do with the transport connections and getting your stuff in and getting your stuff out. And uh, with, with the port of Rotterdam, port of Antwerp, uh, and what are the main ports in, in England, uh, with Super Airport, uh, Brussels Airport, New York Airport, we have, we have the main passenger, we have a few of the main passenger airports, but also cargo. And then in addition to this, uh, the UPS hub and the TNT FedEx hubs are, are just around the corner as well. Uh, UPS in, in Germany and TNT FedEx in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Belgium. So um, it is really uh, the center of Europe and very close connected to the main markets. Also, also from a logistics perspective, it is, it is really uh, the sweet spot for European fulfillment and warehousing. Uh, we move on to the next slide. Uh, another really, really important uh, uh, element is, is compliance. Uh, and compliance has different aspects. One has to do with product safety. That's kind of out of scope for today's presentation. Um, but if we look at duties and VOT, um, you know, that's really important. Where, to be honest, the duties part is relatively simple because that's harmonized throughout Europe. So basically, based on your HS codes, that's uh, the product code of each product. Um, you can identify the, 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 the customs rate, the duty rate, and that is the same throughout Europe. And also the, the process is, is harmonized. So on the customs part, there's hardly any differences between the different countries, although in one country the customs authorities can be a bit stricter or, or easy to work with than in others, but, but the, the legal structure and the rates are the same. Another important thing to mention on duties is that on average they are pretty low, everything for some products even zero, up to three, four, five percent is already quite, quite, you know, a high duty rate. So um, if the duty rates don't have that much impact on, on the compliance side, the VAT does. A VAT it is less harmonized in Europe uh, than, than duties are. Uh, so countries have some freedom to, 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 to play around with it, to make it more attractive for companies uh, to, 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 uh, to work with. Um, and it's are pretty high. VAT on average is 20%. Um, so that has really a big impact, it has a big impact on your, on your, on your operation and on your pricing. Although, and that's a very important thing to realize, uh, VAT should not be a cost for you, it's only a cost for an end user. So if you set up your VAT structure properly, um, you can avoid either paying, uh, the VOT up front, or on the, on the other side, side, you can reclaim it back. back. Um, you know, it's a technical uh, thing, but, but basically, uh, um, if you do it properly, uh, VOT should not be a cost for you, um, but only for the end user. What we really say, uh, and what we really advise, um, dive into this, make sure that you do it properly, and you need to have a specialist ready to work with to take care of this. 
um, and, and, and that would be uh, and specifically if you were running a use of the VOT deferment um, on import, and you would need to have a, a, a fiscal representative who will take care of your fiscal administration um, to do it properly. Uh, if we go to the next slide, and I'm not going to say too much on this because this is pretty technical. And um, I, I assume that if people have been in touch with uh, companies or have been working with your team in Europe in the past, um, they will be familiar with the fact that different countries have a threshold for the VOT, what basically means that if you if you the volume of the product um, and, and the volume of the uh, leads to a specific uh, VOT amount. If you stay below this, you don't need to register for VOT in that particular country. Um, and only once you uh, uh, exceed the threshold of the country, you want to register in the country. Well, this was pretty complicated. And the good thing is, uh, last year that has been abolished. So the whole threshold uh, situation, threshold situation does no longer exist. Basically, if you uh, appoint a fiscal representative and you um, ask for a registration for OSS or IOSS, but basically means one stop shop, OSS one stop shop, means that you have a one stop shop for all your VAT related issues. Within Europe. So, suppose you work with a Dutch uh, VOT uh, office, they will take care of all the financial transactions with the different VOT uh, offices in the other countries. You will not, burn, you're not, you don't have any other uh, uh, financial transactions or relationships, or you don't need to register in those countries. So, that's that's really makes it much easier. Um, so um, that's a, that's a major change, and it is a major uh, harmonization within Europe. Uh, once again, it is pretty technical, um, and, and it's really worthwhile to, to reach out to a representative who, who will be in charge of this whole process um, if, if you would set up in Europe. Uh, bottom line, uh, um, VAT should not be a cost, but you need to set it up carefully, um, and, and, and that's the takeaway, I guess, and, and really, um, it is a thing you need to, um, if, you, if you start thinking of, uh, thinking of setting up an operation, start with thinking of this as well, because it is part of the total um, uh, uh, project. So then, moving on to, um, Final decision that somebody would need to make because the company would need to make. And if you want to set up an operation, am I going to set up my own operation or uh, am I going to outsource it to a third party? Uh, I don't want to say too much on this. Uh, basically, uh, when you want to avoid, if you're a small, medium sized company, you want to be like low key in Europe. So you want to avoid having a local presence, you want to avoid. Uh, uh, Bank and staff. So for most most companies, um, going for the outsourced option is, is is a very good start. And there's a lot of companies that are really well equipped to take care of everything you would need. So we're going to move on to the to my final slide. How uh, basically uh, what we see the three main questions companies have if they want to set up in the Europe: what's the location? How can I do compliance? Compliant on VOT and on customs, and also on, on, on regulatory. And how can I find a partner? Um, please, you know, that is our core business. Um, we can help you finding your way into Europe. You can be in touch with the companies that are familiar with your product, that are able to help smaller sites. Um, so please reach out to us and um, final remark, uh, our services are confidential, but also for your charge because our funding comes partly from the government and partly from our membership base. So any services we offer to foreign companies is free of charge. Well, that's it from my side. We're a little bit over time, so for that, could I hand over to you, uh, Joanne, to remind us. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much. And I'm very pleased to say we still have a good core of our attendees that stuck with us for the hour and 15. So thank you so much. That, uh, and I'm glad to hear that you found it helpful. I just wanted to round off very quickly. But before I do so, uh, we've got one last poll. And that's very much, uh, you know, for you, 
to let us know whether you um, you would like to find out a little bit more and have more information about supply chain solution and high uh, HIDC services. So everything that Jan Paul has just shared with you, the different services they use, and the opportunity for you uh, as well to make the most of it as you enter or as you expand in the market, please do let us know and uh, we'll obviously uh, then Jan Paul and the team will be will make sure to get in touch. So it's great to see that, you know, we still have a good attendees list. Uh, I've been able to stick past the hour and uh, we're getting a very positive, very enthusiastic response. So that's fantastic. Very good to see. I can see a few more are coming in. Don't be shy. Just put your votes in, you know, if... <laughs> If you'd like for Jan Paul to send you uh, more information, there will be the recording of today's sessions uh, available on our website, on YouTube, and it will be sent to you uh, over, I believe, early next week. And uh, let me just close this poll for now. And very conscious of time, I just wanted to uh, move, move on very quickly about maybe some uh, key takeaways. I know, Jan Paul, if you've got anything left that you'd like to say in terms of key takeaways from, from your end? No, no, not really. I, I think, you know, we, we're running out of time, uh, so no, no, no takeaways. Take you know, I think it was really great to have the opportunity to do this together. Um, once again, I think it is two key topics uh, for companies. Uh, if you want to be successful, you need to have both in place. Uh, so, so uh, you know, it really adds, uh, you know, it really makes sense to, to you know, to reach out to both of us on this. Absolutely. And uh, just promoted the last slide from, uh, you know, very much from our end, as Jan Paul mentioned, uh, you know, the synergies there, it makes sense to have everything set up. There are opportunities there in Europe. There are partners here to work with you. So what do you need? Online business development tool. Go online, leverage the online opportunities, localized website, online marketing and a very strong supply chain strategy are going to allow you to be found, be understood, and then eventually do business and grow your business in the international markets. On these slides, again, I thank all of you that stuck with us today. I hope you found it um, informational. I apologize. Uh, I'm sorry, Susanna couldn't join us again. We've had some technical issues, but she's uh, very much looking forward to uh, getting in touch. You know, the team here at BT Online and uh, Jan Paul team will be in touch with those of you who have uh, um, requested for us to do so. And as I mentioned, we will be sending a recording of today's um, webinar with the slide deck as well uh, over the next couple of business days. And uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, we wish you a fantastic day ahead, a great weekend when it comes along. But first of all, a very, very, very big thank you to, uh, to yourself, Jan Paul, for joining us today and sharing such fantastic information. I hope everyone find it as useful as I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, all. Take care. And we'll be online soon. Bye. Bye.